Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Now we are going to talk about our bread and butter, funeral homes. Some of you may wish to own your own funeral home. Some of you may wish to be just an employee or a manager. Very good and respected peer by the name of Dean Gunter. He worked for 50 years. Never aspired to be an owner, according to his admission, but enjoyed working and loved being a funeral director. And he really is one of the um, the most impressive people who has influenced me in regards to being a uh, penultimate funeral professional. His brother Dale, however, had other aspirations. Um, Dale owned a very nice funeral home. He just recently retired uh, in the St. Petersburg area. And I got to visit that funeral home when their mother passed away. And a very delightful funeral home. One of those places that you know maybe I wish I would have worked at at one point. Um, and their individual aspirations, even though that they're twins, were completely different. So you will decide for yourself what it is you wish to do. So let's look at what a funeral home is. And you can give yourself time to decide if you wish to own one. So a fixed place for conducting the funerals and or care and preparation of the dead prior to disposition is a definition of a funeral home. And the determination of whether an establishment constitutes a funeral home depends upon the activities. So, practical case in point. I received a call from a rabbi. And rabbi wished to attach to his um, synagogue a place of preparation for the washing. Okay? For the washing. And when you take funeral directing, you will learn the terms for things um, regarding Judaism, such as Tahara, the Shevra Kadisha, etc., etc. When he consulted with the state, the state said, you're going to need a funeral director's license, or a funeral home establishment license, and you'll need to have a funeral director in charge, which in the state of Florida here is a combination license. You are a licensed funeral director and an embalmer, because we offer separate licensing, funeral director and embalming only. This being an orthodox synagogue, this was something of a problem because they cannot touch dead remains. So that makes the embalming portion of a mortuary curriculum a bit problematic because that is a requirement of your accrediting body for your program, the American Board of Funeral Service Education. So, termination of what constitutes a funeral home. Do we have a place for conducting funerals? Yes, the synagogue. They had areas for conducting the services for their dead. Care and preparation of the dead prior to disposition. Yes, they had a specific area set aside from the synagogue strictly for the preparation and care of the dead. Does it matter if it's a prep room? No. Did it matter that they embalmed? No. But under this type of definition, the synagogue would need to have a funeral, direct, uh, funeral home establishment license, at least in the state of Florida. And again, that Pesky police power jumps in, makes life miserable. Already seen the courts will uphold licensing requirements, things like that, that protect the consumer and protect the public health. The courts have routinely upheld these restrictions. Uh, business corporations in Pennsylvania are prohibited from owning funeral homes because the government of Pennsylvania fears that corporations with for-profit only motivations would be a risk to the consumer. Licensees must be profession or restricted corporation owned by funeral directors. So they're not saying that a corporation cannot own a funeral home. Remember our business agency lesson. Corporation provides a great amount, a tremendous amount of immunity from liability because the corporation is doing the act, right? It's saying that a corporation that wishes to purchase a funeral home a gigantic conglomerate, they are not inclined to want to do that. And relatively recent, 1983. You can imagine that the corporations um, that are out there are probably less than thrilled about that. And this may have changed since the publishing of the book. Courts tend to examine administrative regulations of state boards with great scrutiny in New Jersey. A court shot down a law prohibiting a funeral director from managing more than one firm. They said the regulation did not have any reasonable relationship to the safeguarding of public health. 1951, shot down a law prohibiting a person from managing more than one place. And yet here, right now, 2016 in the state of Florida, 
It is against the law for any funeral director in charge or embalmer in charge of a funeral home or centralized embalming facility, respectively, to manage more than one facility. So a funeral director in charge of a funeral home could not also be an embalmer in charge at a centralized preparation facility. They must have their own independent licenses. They also found the state board could not restrict the serving of food or alcohol in a funeral home since those rules exceeded the statutory authority of the board. Now, notice what this says. It doesn't say that it can't be restricted, but the state board is not the party to do it. Promised you, back when we talked in business law, when we talked about tenancy, nuisance, that we would discuss it further here. And here it is. Nuisance. An invasion of a landowner's interest in reasonable use and enjoyment of his land. An unreasonable, unusual, or unnatural use of one's property so that it disturbs the peaceful, quiet, and undisturbed use and enjoyment of nearby property. As I grow up, I have more and more of an urge to be a nuisance. Maybe it's just the election year. Who knows? In areas without zoning laws, funeral homes are targets of nuisance suits because people don't like living next to funeral homes. Oh, it's so depressing. Oh, I can smell things. Oh, dear God, so bad. Boo-hoo. So many excuses. Yet they're happy to wake you up at 3 in the morning when they have a question about something. Courts, however, generally refuse to declare funeral homes a nuisance per se. You might remember that term, nuisance per se, which means you are a nuisance. No matter what, because you're a funeral home, you are a nuisance, nuisance per se. Courts don't view us as nuisance per se because we are lawful necessary businesses unless we're in an area that we could be offensive, predominantly or strictly residential. This happened in 1925, way back in Alabama. Bama! Nuisance suits do not succeed with any frequency when you are in a business area or area in transition. So in 1991, residents lost their minds when a funeral home tried to open. The judge basically said, shut up. There's four or five other businesses in a two-block radius, and it's not a nuisance. If you have a mixture of businesses and homes, generally the suit is going to fail. Now that's for a funeral home. Crematories can pose their own, their own complex problems. Zoning ordinances are important. They come into play here. The regulations dividing the municipality and the geographical sections and specifying for each such section nature, character, and use of buildings or occupancy within those individual areas. So a funeral home is a commercial use. It's a business use of property. We're not a residence. Now, granted, back in the day, we, you know, funeral parlors. People used our homes, our actual homes, for the purpose of funeralization. But these days, it is pretty well founded that we are a commercial use. And even if we live there as the owners, we actually use that as our primary residence, that does not that we are a business purpose. There are some exceptions for old school funeral homes in residential areas. And these are generally grandfathered in when laws change. Uh, may restrict expansion, renovate, build building, which is part of a problem. Uh, what comes to mind, one of these firms here in Florida, a um, little area called Tarpon Springs. If you're ever visiting Florida, if you haven't been to Tarpon Springs, you're looking for some amazing Greek food. It's a predominantly um, Grecian community. They have a funeral home up there, Vincent Funeral Home, V-I-N-S-O-N, Vincent. And they've been there for 150 years. I want to say it's 150. It might be like 125. But it's a hell of a long time, man. Uh, they've been there forever. And they are smack dab in this little neighborhood. And no really big parking lot, not a whole lot to, you know, work with. And they are restricted in what they do because they're in one of those type of areas it's talking about here. Some areas have professionals that operate out of their homes, doctor, dentist, salesman, music teachers. Uh, and it's regularly ruled that a funeral home does not qualify for that type of exemption. And if you're living in some place with like a, a homeowners association and they find out you're doing stuff like that, they can start really getting on your nerves and being a nuisance per se. Courts also rule that funeral homes do not qualify as either a place of assembly or a public building, so any sort of exception based on those concepts also fail. We may offer our services as a public call. There is a uh, firm I visited in, um, oh Lord, not Missouri, in Twin Cities, Minnesota, that's the state I'm looking for, 
Uh, Bradshaw, Life Celebration Centers. Go online and check them out. Bradford Life Celebration Center, I believe is what it's called. Um, very, very environmentally friendly. Like probably one of the most green places, quote unquote, um, that you will ever see right now in the funeral service industry. Absolutely phenomenally cool. And fact of the matter is, one of the things when meeting with the Bradshaw family, and they are wonderful people, absolutely wonderful people, um, is their chapel is gorgeous. And if you go, you just walk into their chapel, it looked like someplace you'd want to have your wedding. And they have a beautiful grand piano, I think it was there. And they regularly allow local music teachers and high schools to do recitals in their life celebration center because it accommodates a large um, group of people. It has areas for cooking and catering. I mean, it's a phenomenal place. Check it out. Great, great concept to base your, uh, your business model off of. Not going to lie. Generally, it is difficult to start a funeral home in a residential area due to the zoning laws or possibility of a nuisance suit. Just not worth it. Those that are in a residential area may have difficulty expanding or doing major reconstruction, so the disadvantages maybe outweigh the convenience. Carefully research proposed areas. Carefully look at your zoning laws in the municipalities. And if there are no zoning laws, you better go knocking on doors. You better seriously do some due diligence. And always enlist a real estate attorney to assist you in opening or locating a business. You want to make sure that you are complying with all the local laws of operation, and a local real estate attorney will be um, ideal to assist you with that. Businesses, individuals are increasingly trying to get a piece of our pie. So here in Florida, we have a category of licensee called direct disposer. Many states do not have this. In the state of Florida, direct disposers are permitted to perform direct immediate cremation, nothing more. They can't schedule services. They can't place a phone call to a church. The only thing they can do is take the biographical information necessary for a death certificate, put an obituary into the paper or a death notice, and they really shouldn't, if you're going to put service information, that's frowned upon because they want to make sure that you are not overstepping your bounds as direct exposure. Um, very, very restricted license. Many other areas, um, funeral homes, um, choose to work at that business model, cremation only, direct cremation, no services, but they are licensed, excuse me, as funeral homes. You have shipping facilities. Um, depending on your state, you may have a separate license, such as, excuse me, at a uh, centralized embalming facility that is capable of receiving, embalming, and um, transporting remains. Generally, if you are doing anything with the death certificate, that usually requires some sort of funeral home establishment license here in the state of Florida. That differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, Central Prep here in Florida requires that you only offer your services to other funeral professionals, and all you can do is pick up and bomb and deliver to funeral homes for even shipping purposes, I believe. Delivery services, that's your, that's your fleet. If you want to buy a bunch of hearses, a bunch of limos, and rent them out, oorah. States have begun to update, expand licensing statutes and regulations, including registration, licensing of such businesses. Your book even says Florida has the most comprehensive laws in the U.S. regarding these things. Whoop, whoop, Florida pride, yeah! So one of the big things that affects your funeral home facility is the American with Disabilities Act. One of the principal purposes is to provide disabled individuals with full use and enjoyment of public accommodations. Generally, it requires businesses to remove architectural, communication, and transportation barriers, provided that removal is readily achievable. Oh, yeah, here it comes. Funeral homes are subject to the section of the ADA. There are two standards, and the more strict applies to firms after 90, 1993, as any new building that was constructed for occupancy must comply with ADA. Even with the lower standard for those prior to 1993, they may require substantial investments for renovations to at least get them to the minimum level required by law. And understand, this is the federal Americans with Disabilities Act. Your individual states might have extra stuff that they have tacked in to make them, quote unquote, more cool. There is a list of priorities that you need to memorize. And this is not hard stuff. So if you have a funeral home, you have a set of priorities. The first priority is access from public areas, sidewalks, ramps, doorways, curb cuts, handicapped parking. Second priority is to provide access to areas of public accommodation where goods or services are made available for the public. Your chapels, arrangement offices, casket rooms, might need assisting, assistive listening devices. Furniture will allow for easy access for um, battery-powered vehicles such as rascals or wheelchairs. 
Display of sales merchandise to allow for viewing for people who cannot stand. You might even need to have ADA accessibility for your cremation viewing area. People wish to witness the initiation of the cremation or identification of bodies. Third priority is restrooms. You might have to widen stalls, toilet seats raised, grab bars, lowering of paper towel dispensers, full length mirrors, all sorts of good stuff. And finally, fourth priority, final priority, is any other measures needed to ensure access to good services and facilities? Public telephones, those have gone the way of the dodo bird, right? Everyone's got a cell phone these days. Lowering drinking fountains, high pile carpet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the way I kind of remember it, and it seems to work for my students. How do I get into the place? Once I'm there, can I actually do what I'm supposed to do while I'm there? Range a funeral, go to a funeral. Can I go to the bathroom? And finally, can I do anything else I might need to do at the funeral home? That's kind of the way I wrap it in my mind. So this readily achievable stuff, that's like the reasonable standard, right? Sounds sketchy already. American with Disabilities Act only requires readily achievable items and uses some evaluating factors, cost and nature of the removal, overall financial resources of the business, number of people employed at the site, expense of instituting the renewal the removal, impact it's going to have on the overall scope of business, and overall resources if you have a parent company, if you're a subsidiary or whatever. The cost and nature of removal is subject to the business sense of the owner of the funeral home. However, if the ADA challenges your judgment, the owner has the burden of proof to prove that it was burdensome and detrimental. Two factors are going to help you that you did something, you engaged in a self-assessment, made a deliberate decision not to remove the barrier, but have shown at least a good faith effort with compliance. And you at least instituted or investigated alternatives to what the ADA requested. So your book uses a casket room on the second floor for an example. Owner would need to show the detrimental cost of installing an elevator or lift and then show that it assembled a binder with detailed descriptions and photos of caskets or installed a computer with a large screen TV so that all the arrangements are now done electronically on the first, et cetera, et cetera. Don't need to put in a $60,000 elevator, but are you doing something so that a person who cannot climb stairs is able to enjoy the public accommodation? ADA protects not only the individual with a disability, but also anyone with a close relationship to the disabled individual. Family members are generally within the scope of ADA. Now, what I want to talk about here is caregivers also fall into this category. So if you've been to a movie theater recently, me, recently I just saw the new Ghostbusters movie. Jury's out with people whether they like it or not. I personally liked it. I'm a ghost head. I'm a nerd. I got to built my own proton pack, I'm hardcore. Um, and while I'm in this theater, I, got, I went to see it in IMAX. I wanted my, you know, IMAX 3D nonetheless. I wanted to get a headache with the 3D effects. I wanted my eardrums to explode with the IMAX base. I mean, I wanted the full physical impact of watching this movie. And I see that there's like three seats, spaces, with a little handicap sticker on the ground. Then three or four more seats a little further away, handicap stickers on the ground. And that is for this reason, that... The individual with a disability has a place to see the movie as well as sit next to their family. Because I can remember when I was going to high school, I was going to the movie theater. This was like, you know, 1991 through, actually, yeah, 90. I got to Florida in like 89 from Massachusetts. So I got to see standards in the old theaters. They just had an area with the bar and they just wheeled people with wheelchairs and they just kind of sat there and family sat wherever they could. Nowadays, that's not the case because of the ADA. If a person with contagious disease dies, the funeral home refuses to embalm or offer funeral services, they violated the ADA. That's important. We're not talking about OSHA here. We're not talking about the FTC yet. Okay? We're talking about the American with Disabilities Act. If you make a for contagious disease, you are violating the American with Disabilities Act. That is an important, very important thing to notice. Department of Justice, private suits have been brought against 
could impose surcharges when embalming individuals that have died of contagious diseases. Now, what does this say? Okay, what does this say? I have a person comes back from Nairobi. I had a gentleman who worked at the high school I used to go to who um, was from Africa. A gentleman by the name of Gregory Alvord. Phenomenal to listen to the gentleman speak. I have another friend who was married um, actually to a woman from, I want to say, uh, Zimbabwe. And I love listening to her speak. Phenomenal accent. I just love it. And they will say someone visits family, they come back and they have contracted Ebola. One, at least with Ebola, we know we can't have screwed on that. Okay? That's out of the question. But now what if we're talking about something like Creutzfeldt Jacob disease? So you may know that as Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. It's the Y is German, so J is Y. Okay? Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. It's known as a disease called a spongiform encephalopathy. Basically, turns your brain to cheese, drills holes all through. It's like tuberculosis for your melon. Okay? That is not a bar to embalming. But the protocol for CJD cases or any of the uh, spongiform encephalopathies is destruction and disposal of anything bodily fluid contact, especially um, spinal fluid, cerebral fluid, etc. So if you have to throw away things like several hundred dollar instruments because you don't have disposables, or the extra cost of having to utilize something like that, how do we then charge a family forward for this? Is that fair to the funeral? Does the funeral home have to eat it? Is it fair? Is it fair? So the only thing I can tell you is that do not refer to those expenses as surcharges. It's not a surcharge. What you are charging for is the biomedical waste disposal under the protocols assigned by your respective boards of health, maybe even regarding the disease, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But do not refer to it as a surcharge. It is not a surcharge. Okay, these are added expenses that come because of the nature of that. And if it's very well documented, chances are you may not get busted in the ADA bust. Um, but certainly early on, we didn't know about Creutzfeldt Jacob or stuff like that. That really had an impact on how we embalm. Uh, there's some wonderful articles on how to embalm and what protocols and steps to take um, in the back issues of the Dodge Chemical Company, Dodge Magazine. I believe a, um, an alumnus of Miami Dade College, Jay Rhodes, is a representative of Dodge Chemical, and he actually wrote the article. Um, all of your chemical reps, all of your boards of health will have information about contagious disease and embalming if it is something that they believe is going to be an epidemic or of severe um, health and safety for funeral practitioners. Public accommodation section of the American with Disabilities Act may be enforced either by the U.S. Attorney General or private individuals. If a business is found to have violated the ADA, the court may order the business to remove the barrier and fine the business up to $50,000 for the first offense. Oh, gee, is that all? And hundred grand for subsequent offenses. Court may also award attorney fees to a private plaintiff. That can be expensive. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. We will see you next time.